Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Sonia Hilgren. I am president of the National Press Club and editor of Farm Journal. I'd like to welcome club members and your guests in the audience today, as, though, as well as those of you watching on C-SPAN, listening on public radio, or on the global internet computer network. Before introducing our head table, I would like to remind you of some speakers we have in coming days and weeks. On Tuesday, April 23rd, Charles Lewis, Executive Director of the Center for Public Integrity, will talk about the financing of presidential campaigns. On Thursday, April 25th, Henry Cisneros, the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, will present the first annual state of America's communities. And on Wednesday, May 8th, Christopher Patton, Governor of Hong Kong, will address a press club audience. Transcripts and audio and videotapes of press club luncheons are available by calling 1-800-NPC-2334. If you have questions for our speaker, please write them on the cards at your tables and pass them up to me. I will ask as many as time permits. I'd now like to introduce our head table guests and ask them to stand briefly when their names are called. From your right, Jean Methvin. Reader's Digest, Eleanor Clift, Contributing Editor at Newsweek, Jeff Hardy, Mobile Press Register, Chris Castile, Washington Bureau Chief, Daily Oklahoman, Carla Calabrese, Attorney with Powell, Goldstein, Frazier, and Murphy, Sylvia Smith, Fort Wayne Journal Gazette, Mrs. Elizabeth Dees, Peggy Robertson, freelance journalist and chairman of the National Press Club Speakers Committee, Joseph J. Levin, Jr., co-founder, Southern Poverty Law Center, Peter Aisler, USA Today, Leland Schwartz, editor and publisher, States News Service, Larry Bivens, Detroit News, Andy Alexander, deputy Washington bureau chief, Cox Newspapers, and Ann Scales of the Boston Globe. <clears throat> Hate crimes, high profile and obscure ones, appear to be on the increase in America. Many of us are stunned, but not today's speaker. He is Morris Dees, a Montgomery, Alabama direct male pioneer turned hate crimes attorney. Over the years, through his Southern Poverty Law Center and its Klan Watch arm, Dees has emerged as one of the top watchdogs of hate crimes in America. He's had some major successes, taking the bite out of hate crimes by hitting them where it hurts, in their pocketbook. In 1987, he secured a $7 million jury award in federal court on behalf of the mother of the late Michael Donald lynched in Mobile, Alabama, by members of the Ku Klux Klan. The verdict marked the first time a Klan group had been held liable for the violent acts of its members. In 1990, Dee secured a $12.5 million jury award in Portland, Oregon, against white supremacist Tom Metzger and the white Aryan nation for their role in the beating death of skinheads by, by I'm sorry, the beating death by skinheads of a young black student. These and other cases are bankrolled by the Southern Poverty Law Center, founded in 1971 by Dee, Julian Bond, and Joseph J. Levin, Jr. They wanted to expand civil rights litigation beyond that being pursued mostly by the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. Bond and Levin had the civil rights community ties. Dees brought them a law degree from the University of Alabama and a knack for raising money. That gets us to the rest of the Morris Dees story. While most people know him for his civil rights litigation work, he is also an astute entrepreneur before he finished college, he had started a direct mail sales company that specialized in publishing books. A decade after he started it, he became a millionaire by selling the business to the Times Mirror Company. That gave him time for politics and law. In 1972, Dees became the finance director for Democratic presidential candidate George McGovern. 
Using his tried and true direct mail techniques, Dees raised more than $24 million for McGovern from 600,000 small donors. He did the same job for Jimmy Carter's successful 1976 bid for the White House. Then he jumped ship and in 1980 worked for Senator Ted Kennedy in Kennedy's bid to unseat Carter. People know Morris Dees, who know Morris Dees describe him as intelligent, creative, dedicated, mercurial, unpredictable. Whatever people think of him, they always admit he is bold and persistent. And he has told me that when he was a young man, he was a star farmer, which is something near and dear to my heart. But on a much more serious vein, <clears throat> this week marks the first anniversary of the bombing in Oklahoma City. Dees, who has tracked far-right paramilitary groups since the early 1980s, tells us in his own way that bold and persistent steps are needed today to combat hate in America. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the National Press Club, Morris Dees, the Chief Trial Counsel for the Southern Poverty Law Center and its Militia Task Force. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I appreciate the invitation from this prestigious National Press Club to be here to speak today. I want to thank those who have contributed to the Southern Poverty Law Center who came as our guest today also, because without your support and those other people who contribute, the Law Center would not be able to run the projects that it does, including our Teaching Tolerance Education program that today provides tolerance education films, books, and videos free to over 55,000 schools. I am glad to come here as a speaker, but I wish I had been able to have come here as a journalist. My parents hoped that I might have become a journalist, and in 1955, they bought me a Smith Corona manual typewriter. <clears throat> and I have to say that uh, the book that I just wrote published by HarperCollins that's out this week, Gathering Storm, America's Militia Threat, all 65,000 words was typed on that manual typewriter. <laughs> it may be the only thing that Theodore Kaczynski and I have in common. <laughs> <clears throat> and, when, and when the government finishes the three they took out of his cabin, I want to have dibs on them because they don't make them anymore, even in third world countries. <laughs> My wife has pushed me to learn the computer, but I haven't been that successful yet. And also, I appreciate the opportunity to be here because most of the time when I'm talking on television concerning the militia or dealing with the print media, I get a, what you really call and you really know of as a sound bite. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you more at length about what I see is a very serious problem in our country today. I was on the Today Show Sunday morning and had one of those opportunities to do a sound bite. But on that program was the leader of a major militia group in this country. And after my telling the uh, host there what I thought about the movement, she turned to him and said, General, what do you think of the militia? And he said, well, we really are a group set out to help people. We uh, actually, we had 50 people at Oklahoma City cleaning up after the bombing, and we kind of like, uh, and when they have storms, we help the National Guard. I wish I had have been able to uh, have responded to him because my time was up. But we heard the same statements made by the Ku Klux Klan in the South in the days of the Civil Rights Movement. I always heard the older people say, well, the Klan's not such a bad group. They help, you know, uh, when a man doesn't support his wife, they take him out behind the woodshed and things like that. But I knew that they bombed churches that killed innocent children and that they lynched black people and did all kinds of things to harass people. And I also know that this militia movement, this group of super patriots, some 800 strong that are in our country today, are made up of some good people, but many of them have a bent to destroy this nation through domestic terrorism. I would have liked to have told the audience on the Today Show that this person from this militia group uh, didn't say that the militia groups publish a catalog. 
selling several hundred books, the militia of Montana, and one of those books tells people how to build bombs. Another book tells them how to be experts at sniping, shooting rifles in order to assassinate public officials. Another one tells them how to commit acts of domestic terrorism. And recently, these groups apparently are continuing their activity. A bank was robbed on the 2nd of May in Spokane, Washington. The FBI said a bomb was set off in two places, and a note was left after the bank was robbed saying that it was as a uh, job of the Aryan Republican Army. And with that note was a, a, a little message that said, this will be the end of Babylon. And Babylon is what some of these people call our federal government. Well, really, who are these people? Who are these people who want to destroy or, ha or, or harm our government through domestic terrorism? We've tracked some 800 groups in the nation, ranging from ardent militant tax protesters to the Aryan Nation, to militia groups, to Klan groups, to uh, <clears throat> groups that are similar to the Freemen in Mon that are being uh, holed up out there now in Montana. Yeah, a large group of people, militant anti-gun advocates, but one thing they have in common, one thing that holds them together, is that they believe that there's a conspiracy, a conspiracy to disarm this country, its citizens, to turn our country over to some evil one-world government. And many in this movement believe that the time for working this out through the political process has passed. The thread that runs through the militia, anti-government extremists in our country is a religious belief called Christian identity. <coughs> These people believe that Aryans are the true children of God, the true Israelites. They believe that Jews are the children, literally, of the devil, and that blacks are beasts of the fields. Those people in the compound in Jordan, Montana, have these beliefs. About two weeks before the standoff began, Leroy Schweitzer and Dale Jacoby Christian identity leaders in this group gave a pep talk to those in, in the compound. We had a tape recording of that conversation and Mr. Schweitzer said, and this is a belief that permeates so much of this movement, the very dangerous part of this movement. He said it's a race war. It's a spiritual war between Satan's seed, Satan's children, the Jews, and God's children. God tells his people to kill many, many times in Scripture. He doesn't allow murder, but he allows killing. Jews brought the blacks into this country to destroy us, and they knew that it would eventually, and it has to this point almost destroyed us. And then another arm of this very dangerous extremist group called the Common Law Courts, you may have heard about, this group also, the Freeman group, have their own common law courts. As you know, they want to be tried before one of those type courts made up of white Aryan males. After having this speech, the common law court met and issued the following order. That we have a standing order for anyone obstructing justice or trying to stop what we're trying to accomplish in this country, and that order is shoot to kill. These groups have been around for quite a while. They're not new, this Christian identity belief, but <clears throat> it's just pretty much been like the Klan, a racist group that attracted very little attention and not many followers because of the odiousness nature of their beliefs. But something happened in 1992 in Ruby Ridge in Colorado. The FBI shot and killed Randy Weaver's wife and his child. 
It was an horrendous thing that happened based on the facts that have since come to light. But Randy Weaver was a member of the Christian identity, a very ardent believer. He attended the Aryan Nations Church, a Christian identity church. And Christian identity leaders around the country said, we're not going to take this. And they saw this as a sign of this evil government planning to kill its citizens who disagreed with it and who had beliefs like they did. An effort to disarm them. And so 160 people was called together two months after Randy Weaver was killed. They was called together in the town of Estes Park, Colorado. And at this meeting, some of the most probably ardent anti-Semitic neo-Nazis, racists, uh, some from other groups that would never ever associate with those people before, some of the anti-tax people, people who believed in English, the first language, they all gathered together to see what they could do, what response could they make to Ruby Ridge. And you have to understand, this was long before the Senate held a hearing three years later to uncover this. But these people were incensed, and rightly so. At this meeting, they chose a keynote speaker, a man who had been the grand dragon of the Texas Klan. His name was Lewis Beam. We had, we was able to, to, uh, to, to know about this meeting and to uh, get a, a uh, tape of the conversations that took place there and the speeches. I wish you could have the opportunity to view that because you could understand and feel the passion these people have and their desire to change this government and to put it back in the hands of God's people, Aryan whites, that they believe should be rightly the rulers of this country. Lewis Beam, who has been indicted for sedition, who was on the FBI's 10 most wanted list, was acquitted by an all-white jury in Arkansas in 1985, was a keynote speaker. I'd like to just share with you his passion because I think you'll understand what infuses this movement. The two murders of the Weaver family, he told the group, have shown all of us that our religion, our political and ideological differences mean nothing to those who wish to make us all slaves. We, all, we are viewed by the government as the same, enemies of the state. Those who wear badges, black boots, and carry automatic weapons and kick in doors already know all they need to know about you. You are the enemies of the state. Do, do my words shock or alarm you? They shouldn't. This these, those in government who have labored over the years to build the road that leads to the new world order at this time are beside themselves with joy. We pledge that those last few miles will be paved not just with the bloods and bones and hearts of the patriots, but they'll be paved, that road will be paved with tyrants' bloods and tyrants' bones. Today, Mr. Beam told this 160 group gathered there that I warn you calmly, coldly, and without reservation that over the next 10 years, you will come to hate government more than anything in your life. We are called upon, he told a crowd who cheered him many times during his speech. We are called upon to make a decision that you will make in the quietness of your heart in the still places of the night. As you lay on your bed and you look up at the ceiling tonight, you must answer the question, will it be liberty or will it be death? As for me, he said, give me liberty or give me death. At that meeting was a man who came from the Beltway, who came from Washington, a man who was head of a group called Gun Owners of America. He was invited to make a speech, and he made a speech. And his name was Larry Pratt, who was a co-chairman of Pat Buchanan's campaign. And Mr. Pratt, who shared that program with Mr. Beam, a known racist, and with the head of the Aryan Nations who gave Sikh Heil salutes there at that program, Mr. Pratt called for armed citizen militias. And after we made our tape available to ABC News, he resigned from the campaign. 
This movement has grown since 1992. You saw a lot about it after the Oklahoma bombing because <clears throat> you saw these individuals on television representing the militias. But those people that you saw, John Trotman, the bearded man from the militia of Montana, Mr. Olson from the militia of, of Michigan, those people are really viewed by Lewis Beam and the Christian identity, the hardcore people, as really jokes. I was reading in Newsweek this week where the FBI decided that they're going to start tracking these people closer and they're having meetings once a week and told the agents to take guys like Trockman out and have a beer. In fact, they pictured Trockman. Well, these people don't talk to the FBI. You know that because in Jordan, Montana, they won't talk to the FBI because they see the FBI as agents of Zog. Zog the Zionist occupied government and they believe that this national worldwide and Jewish this Jewish conspiracy is out to destroy Aryan people and never would one of those people come out of there not the hardcore leaders and turn himself over to what he would consider to be the devil himself it is in the words of the leader who spoke a holy war how does Timothy McVeigh fit into this? On uh, NPR this morning, a representative from the FBI said, well, you know, we don't think anything is going to happen on the 19th because, you know, Timothy McVeigh, and should he be guilty, let me say, and he certainly deserves the benefit of the doubt and the presumption of innocence. But if the government is right, they say that was no conspiracy here, just a couple of loners. Timothy McVeigh is not doesn't represent any kind of organized group trying to harm this government so we don't think a lot is going to happen on April 19th I'm not sure if anything will happen or not the Lewis beams of the world and those who preach the Christian identity are not interested in April 19th they're interested in the long term they have no given date for their agenda their agenda is the destruction of our government as we see it today and as we know it and do I think that these groups will overthrow this country and overthrow this government? No. But do I think that they will cause more domestic terrorism? I do. And I think that the evidence will show it. There have been numerous acts of domestic terrorism before Oklahoma City sponsored by these people. And there has been since, some since. Oklahoma City was just the worst. And it certainly was a wake-up call. Timothy McVeigh was a product of this movement. Timothy McVeigh got a traffic ticket in 1993 not far from the gates of Elohim City, a Christian identity compound in Arkansas on the Oklahoma border. And his phone records showed that he made calls there. They, they, they denied talking to him, but his phone records show he made calls there two weeks before the bombing in Oklahoma. And he subscribed to the Patriot Report, which was a Christian identity publication, and he carried with him the Bible of the Christian identity movement. This Bible is called the Turner Diaries. There have been 200,000 copies published, and you can't buy it in a bookstore. It was written in 1978 by a physicist from Washington who now lives in West Virginia, who heads the National Alliance. America's largest neo-Nazi organization. Mr. Backvey's cell roommates, I should say, in the military said that he carried the book with him, talked to them about it. This fictional book he talked about was the memoirs of an Aryan soldier who survived a war in the late 1990s where the United States was taken back for the Aryan people and Jews were killed and all the blacks was killed. There's a gruesome chapter in this book talking about the day of the rope in which blacks were killed and Jews were hung. Mr. McVeigh had this book with him when he was in gun shows and he sold it. The book opens when the young warrior whose memoirs we're telling about gets with one of his buddies and 
They are supplied with 5,000 pounds of ammonium nitrate fertilizer, and they mixed it with fuel oil, and they drove a truck loaded with that to a federal building and blew it up. And should Mr. McVeigh be guilty in this case, and if he in fact did these deeds, he may well have read the following from that book after he left that building. All day yesterday and most of today we watched the TV coverage of rescue crews bringing the dead and injured out of the building. It is a heavy burden of responsibility for us to bear since most of the victims of our bomb were only pawns who were no more committed to the sick philosophy or the racially destructive goals of the system than we are. But there is no way we can destroy the system without hurting many thousands of innocent people. No way. It is a cancer too deeply rooted in our flesh. And if we don't destroy the system before it destroys us, if we don't cut this cancer out of our living flesh, our whole race will die. In Mr. Buchanan's campaign, he said that it was for the soul, the very soul, of the Republican Party. I think these people in these groups would probably say that their fight is for the soul of our country. They would agree with Mr. Buchanan on many issues, and he in no way, I would assume, would follow their beliefs. But it's speakers who put our government down, whether it's on television, whether it's on radio talk shows, or whether it is, or it's members of Congress or candidates who bash our government on a regular basis that give these paranoid individuals who make up the dangerous element of the militia movement in America a belief that, well, these important people are saying this, it must be true, and it certainly gives them encouragement. Timothy McVeigh, should he be guilty, and Terry Nichols and Mr. Fortier has already pleaded guilty, one of their cohorts. They have an enormous support base here. These groups operate under a policy of call, a, a plan, I should say, called leaderless resistance. This Lewis Beam created this plan. He wrote it out in one of his last publications when he was the leader of the Klan called the Seditionist. And what it means is that small groups with no leaders that can be caught and topple the whole group, will go out and plan their own acts of domestic terrorism and act when they feel like they should act, based on the conditions and the material. And the purpose of the movement, in its many postings on the internet, and the World Wide Web, and the publications and videos and books they sell, is to give inspiration to the Timothy McVeighs in our society. I tried a case in Portland, Oregon, a few years back, representing a family from Ethiopia who lost their son at the hands of skinheads in Portland, Oregon. This young man came to America seeking the American dream like so many immigrants that had come before him and, and went to work at a Catholic church, bringing with him only the clothes on his back. They gave him a job stoking the boiler. Mulagata Sarah was his name. He got his clothes from the Salvation Army. And the next job he got while he was a, a student there at Portland Junior College was working at Avis Rent-A-Car. And he was a slight built man, weighed about 140 pounds, and he was a good employee of Avis. When a person left their bags on the van he used to carry them to out to the satellite car parks for Avis, he would track them down and try to get it back to them. And for his loyalty and allegiance to that company, they made him employee of the month. But there was another man who lived 1,200 miles south in Fallbrook, California, who had a different idea of what America was all about and whose America it is. And his name is Tom Metzger. And he operates a group called the White Aryan Resistance, one of these anti-government extremist groups. And he had become known as the godfather of the skinheads, this 50-year-old man. And he sent an organizer, a young man, vice president of his organization, to Portland, Oregon, to organize a skinhead group there called East Side White Pride to make it a part of his national network. 
And when this young man got there, he explained Metzger's philosophy of creating racial turmoil and racial unrest with the idea that one day we might have some type of racial war in this country. And this young organizer did that when he got to Portland. He met with this East Side White Pride, and one night after meeting, three members of the East Side White Pride with their heads shaved and their Doc Martin boots and clothes walked out on the street, and they saw a young black man get out of a car and walk across the street towards an apartment house. They walked up to him and they taunted him and called him racial names. He said, please, peace, peace. No trouble. Mulligata was begging them to not cause a confrontation. And while one of these skinheads taunted him from the front, another one walked around the back and took a full swing at the back of his head with a baseball bat. And they took the top of his head off and he died there on the streets of Portland that night. The FBI caught those three skinheads and they received long prison sentences. And the case would have ended there, but the police found a handwritten letter from the Metzikas in one of their rooms in a search. I was called into the case by a former United States attorney in that area to see if I couldn't get some money for that family and Mulligala's little son left back in Ethiopia. Tom Metzger, you've seen him on the various talk shows, Donahue and others. He's a slick talker. He had good lawyers that represented him in our lawsuit against him and those skinheads to hold him responsible. But he wanted to argue his own case to the jury because he felt that if he could beat us with our reputation, it would make him a big man in this movement. At the trial, I don't think he counted on the fact that his young vice president, Dave, would become our star witness. Dave was a good, good man in many ways, and I talked to him and he was sorry for the things that he had done. He got on the stand and told that Mesk encouraged him to commit racial violence. Well, after the trial, Metzger stood before the jury to make his closing statement. At my counsel table sat Henoch Sarah, the little son of Milagata that I had brought over from Ethiopia, and he sat there in his native clothes with his grandfather, listening through an interpreter, trying to understand why in this country, the land of the free, his father would be beaten to death for doing nothing to harm anyone. Mesca stood there in front of the jury and said, you may not believe what I believe, but please don't hold me responsible because of my unpopular beliefs. I believe that America is great because of the contributions of Aryan white people. That's my belief. I think that everything that's made this country great, and unless we get rid of these mud people, and by that he means Jews and blacks and Hispanics, the same people that the people hold up in the Freeman compound don't want to sit on their juries, only white Aryan males. He said America will be a third-rate nation soon. I listened and thought, what could I tell that jury to make them render a decision that would not only be important to them, but would send a message across this nation as to whose America this is? I looked at little Henoch sitting there, and I walked over in front of the jury rail, and I said, you know, ladies and gentlemen, I've been watching Mr. Metzger during this trial, and his children are sitting behind him on the row there. And you know, they never had to worry about getting polio because of the genius of the Jewish doctor, Jonas Salk. And if we lived in Tom Metzger's America, we wouldn't have the beautiful music of the Jewish composer Leonard Bernstein or the brilliance of the black general Colin Powell. And I mentioned other people and other nationalities and other races and other religions that had played a major part in this country. And I close by saying this country, this America that Tom Metzger believes in is an America that never existed never existed. America is great because of our diversity, not in spite of it. And I say today to, to those members in the militia groups who have chosen to use it as a protest method against our country, that true patriots in this nation line up at the ballot box, not in militia columns. 
and the myths that they tell about the militias that helped found this country, and we had the militias that certainly did it. They did it because this nation was subjected to a tyrannical king, George of England, who did not allow us to vote. We had taxation without representation. And the Sons of Liberty that Sam Adams headed was a group of true patriots. But once we got the right to vote, that changed the whole ball game. And in the words of Abraham Lincoln during the darkest hour of our country, I believe also that our last best hope is in our democracy. Thank you. Let me say this before we have questions, and I welcome your questions. Tom Metzger, who always condemned minorities for f their seeking welfare and, and leeching off the government and not being responsive citizens, responsible citizens, I took a great deal of pleasure when we executed on that $12.5 million verdict, and he certainly doesn't have that money, but we took his house, we took his land, we took his business, and we controlled his post office box and get a portion of the money out for little Henoch. Back in Alabama, we try to call, we call that cleaning their plow. <laughs> but you know, but what made what made me uh, feel somewhat uh, redeemed here was after he lost all that, he went down and applied for food stamps. <laughs> Could you assess the role of the the, the press is playing in exposing hate groups and hate crimes, and what should the press be doing? I think the press is playing a very valuable role. The only thing that I would suggest is that we don't just find the John Trotmans and the face cards of the militia movement, that we try to get those people who express the true views of this Christian identity and other groups. I do think that uh, if those people do come on, a responsible person opposing it from the religious community would be important to have. I don't believe that by ignoring this, it'll go away. It didn't come about because of the press, and it won't go away if you ignore it. I think the American public, the American jury, will render the final verdict, and it will be against these people. Do you think the Oklahoma uh, bombing should receive the breadth of media coverage that O.J. Simpson's trial did? I'm understanding that, that both of them see an enormous amount of coverage. Uh, I, I think Excuse me. I think O.J. got a little more. Oh, did it? I'm sorry. I didn't check the ratings. Uh, well, you know, we're, we're kind of in tabloid journalism, and it's creeped into the mainstream journalism today, and I guess it's what the public wants. Uh, I think the Oklahoma City bombing got wonderful coverage, and, and it's important coverage. And I want to commend the governor of Oklahoma and the people of Oklahoma because they showed what this country was made of. And I don't think Timothy McVeigh and the people, if he's guilty, that did this ever expected that it would galvanize this country as it did. <clears throat> How much of the uh, current militia movement is rooted in the John Birch movement of the 1960s? What are the differences? I think that you'll find threads of the prayer cloth of the militia movement today originating back in the John Birch movement, McCarthy eras, the silver shirts of the 30s. This didn't just start yesterday. We've had anti-government people and feelings in our country for many years. Uh, and it's no way to have a real neat divining line. Uh, I don't know the philosophy that much of the John Birch Society that came along probably when I was in junior high school. But I, I, I think one of the things that they did there uh, was something that the governor of my own state started, George Wallace, was they tapped a vein of anti-government feeling 
and then probably expose it for the first time. And these people today are playing it out to its fullest. White supremacist leaders weren't especially effective in rallying farmers during the farm crisis or blue-collar workers in the 1980s, but they see the 1990s as more hospitable. Why? Is that because of economic uncertainty? Well, the thing about farmers, as you know, working with the Farm Journal, even though the prices are bad, we get another spring, and when things look good and farmers go back and the price of land went up, and the farmers could see that it wasn't a giant Jewish conspiracy taking away their land from defaulted mortgages. It was simply just pure economics. And the farm movement rejected it because they weren't anti-Semitic in the beginning. They didn't buy this Zog conspiracy. Uh, I think that, uh, excuse me, let me see a question. Folks in the Northeast. And, I, and the same with the folks in the Northeast and with the spotted owl and the, all, all the other kinds of things. That, then that was the problem that these extremists, these neo-Nazis, the Aryan nations had. Nobody was buying the message because this message of hate wasn't selling. But with Ruby Ridge and the passage of the Brady Bill and the uh, uh, assault rifle ban, they were, they were able to pull under that tent a lot of people, a disparate groups, who had never joined together before. In fact, at the Estes Park meeting, the tapes that we read from it, one of the arguments was, well, look, I don't want to be here with these people over here because I don't believe in their philosophy. And someone stood up and said, look, we can argue about that later once we win this war. How many of these groups exist in this country today, and how many followers do they have? That would be a difficult question to answer. In a book we published, a report we published called False Patriots recently, uh, we tracked some 800 anti-extremist, anti-government groups. Uh, many of them uh, anti-gun groups that believe the NRA is liberal, so I would call them extremist. Uh, groups, that, groups that are anti-tax groups, about 400 of those are militia groups, and about a third of those have direct white supremacist, neo-Nazi connections. The most dangerous aspect of this whole movement, though, are those secret cells, those small groups that you don't know about. The kind that uh, Mr. McVeigh and Mr. Nichols and his friends may have had if they are guilty in this attack, a small group that doesn't advertise itself. Unfortunately, these groups don't go down to the Chamber of Commerce and list their register their groups or their members, and it's hard to track them. The number of people involved, I would say that there are approximately 35 to 40,000 hardcore Christian identity believers in this country. They have a, a very slick publication called The Jubilee, published in California, and just had a national meeting at Lake Tahoe in California, and they had 500 people attend. They had a meeting which 900 people attended on the weekend after the Oklahoma bombing. Uh, it's a very active group, and uh, it's a very dangerous group. Thank you. Has something changed in our national psyche uh, to make so many people ripe for hate, be it directed at blacks, non-Christians, gay people? We've seen the civil rights movement change from having an apartheid government in our country to at least open and full apparent rights for blacks. But there's been a backlash to that. There's been a backlash to affirmative action, to uh, court decisions that divided legislative and judicial districts up that guaranteed the representation of people. Those in this movement and many who aren't in this movement say that that's not American. That's a guaranteed slice of the pie. And that's not fair. That's the debate that's going on in this country today. And that, it, that is maybe played out in a political situation one way. These People in, this, in these extremist groups see it as part of that conspiracy of this Zionist occupied government to take away the rights of white males. Uh, what's happened in the psychic of our country? I think our country's maybe not a lot different than it always was. We've always had our ups and downs. I'm not that alarmed about the psychic of our country. Uh, we have less civility. We see this in courtrooms. We see it in, in programs like Crossfire. I mean, we live in the Crossfire generation that everybody's got an opinion and feel like it's entitled to full weight. Uh, it's, it's, it's a, maybe it's the, uh, 
the world that Ted, Ted Theodore Kaczynski saw, in which technology has, has isolated us and reduced our contact with people. We see our small towns and villages drying up and the small family farms going away, and we are losing something that really truly made America great. And it's that people reaching out on the internet, sitting in front of a computer talking to total strangers, seeking desperately to be with someone, to be cared about, and to be loved. And I think that's what I found to be the biggest problem when I dealt face to face with a lot of these people and leaders in this movement. The government is being very cautious in its dealings with the free men in Montana. Is that the best way to deal with those groups? How long should the FBI wait? And could it be that the FBI's reluctance to move in it would be viewed by supremacists as some sort of victory? The FBI was monitoring this group 11 months before. They had people in there monitored and gained some very valuable information. I saw an editorial in the New York Times blaming the FBI for going too slow. They were blamed for going too fast at Waco. I think the FBI is taking the right position. Uh, and the only haste we see here is media generated. Uh, we, we have, you know, I don't know how long media wants to camp out out there in the, in the flatlands in Montana. Uh, but they've, they've interviewed everybody there, and the T-shirts say, have you been interviewed? <laughs> and, and they have to do a story. And I, was, uh, I, I, I saw that no story today in the Washington Post or the New York Times concerning the Freeman. The FBI is taking the right position. These aren't just white-collar criminals, though. If Dan Rostentowski, who recently was indicted for stealing a half million dollars of public funds, after being indicted, had boarded himself up and used his children and women as shields and said that he was going to kill the federal judge that sentenced him, we wouldn't consider him then a white-collar criminal. He would have stepped over the line. That's exactly what these people are doing. They should not be allowed to leave there and escape. It would set a bad example to these other people in this movement because all they'd have to do is hold up somewhere and think our timid law enforcement won't act. I don't know the results of Waco and what happened. I don't know whether Dave, David Koresh, who molested and raped and sexually assaulted little girls, ever wanted himself to be put on trial. I don't know whether he wasn't like Jim Jones and wanted simply to kill everybody in the place. It looked like that may be the case. Hindsight's 2020. But I don't believe that Oklahoma City bombing was the moral equivalency of, Oklahoma, of the Waco thing. Because whoever drove that truck up didn't give those kids 51 days to get out. They did a very cowardly deed. But those in the movement see it blood for blood, children for children. And I think the FBI has a great opportunity now, and I think they will get those people out. There are men in there who will kill an FBI agent, and the FBI knows this. The FBI has been very patient, and I think that Louis Free is doing a wonderful job. And I think he has all the tools he needs to do the job with, and, he'll, and he will end up be the victor here. Thank you. Encryption software uh, enables these groups to exchange their strategies over the internet without fear of exposure. Has the internet made it easier for hate groups to communicate and proselytize, or on some level has it made it easier to keep track of some of them? It certainly makes them be able to get in touch with each other much faster. There are dozens and dozens. You can't even keep up with the pages they have on the internet, Stormfront and others. Uh, William Pierce, who wrote the Turner Diaries, didn't just write a book, 1978, and quit. After the Oklahoma bombing, on his internet page and on his, t on his radio show, his shortwave radio, he claims 100,000 listeners, said that we will see more domestic terrorism, and he said, be prepared to kill, to take back our country, and words to that effect. So these people are getting their message across quicker and faster. And they don't have to publish some pamphlet and get a mailing list and mail it to it. As far as whether this encryption software makes a difference, I don't really think so. Uh, people have had coded ways of communicating in the past, and I don't think that law enforcement sees that as a major problem. Thank you. On the Today Show appearance that you mentioned, uh, also was um, 
uh, former CIA and FBI director William Webster, who said that you really can't do much to these militia groups until they do something illegal. You didn't get a chance to respond to this view. What do you think of Director Webster's position? <clears throat> I didn't get a chance to respond, and I wanted to tell Judge Webster that it's been nearly 10 years since he was in the FBI, and I respect him greatly, but I went back to my office that morning, have to get up early for the Today Show, and I typed him a long letter, and I sent him a list of probably 75 or 80 crimes that these militia groups had committed, and that they weren't simply just out there exercising their free speech rights, which they certainly have the right to do. I sent him a copy of my new book, Gathering Storm, and marked a few places for him to read, and a copy of the Patriot Report. And I hope he now has a better understanding. These people who scream that we're violating their First Amendment rights are exercising their rights of First Amendment when they speak. In America, you have the right to hate, whether it be another person or the government, but you don't have the right to hurt. And under the Attorney General guidelines passed by and enacted after we had the excesses of the FBI during the Vietnam days, under those guidelines, it says the FBI can investigate, infiltrate any domestic group once that group has let it be known that it intends to violate the law, to, call, to use violence to carry forth its goals. And these groups put this on the internet. They pass it out everywhere. It's not a big secret. I think the FBI knows this, and recently in a trial, and in fact the trial is going on right now in Muskogee, Oklahoma, three members of the Constitutional Militia of Oklahoma are charged with a plot to bomb our building in the ADL office in Houston, Texas. And when the FBI agents arrested them, they found them mixing an ammonium nitrate bomb like the one used in Oklahoma City, but not as big. It came out in that trial that a militia leader who had been kind of a big mouth on television was a paid FBI informant. And, and he, I don't, know, don't think he thought that that would come out. The FBI had to put him up, I guess. And I was very pleased to see that the FBI was at work. It made me feel good. And I want to thank them for exposing that plot because I would not have wanted that man to come down and blow up our new building. Thank you. <laughs> What is the latest count of black churches burned in Alabama? What progress has been made in finding the arsonists? Could you speak to the possible <clears throat> connections between the domestic terrorist movement and the church fires in the South? I don't see any connection at all between the anti-government extremist patriot movement and church burnings in the South or anywhere in the country. Those that have been burned in the South were certainly burned, that are black churches, were burned by racists. These racist individuals appear to be from the few that have been caught copycatting each other across the South. Most of them in Alabama have been burned in predominantly black counties with 50 to 75 percent black population, and we don't show of those dozen or two churches, I think a dozen or so have been burned in Alabama, I know it's 23 since January 1995 nationwide, that they had any connection with any racist groups. And they caught a white man in Selma recently that burned one of them, and he, and he was certainly a racist, but he was, had no connection with the Klan. In Barnwell, South Carolina, though, uh, over the past weekend, three churches were burned. One of them was black and two of them was white. And I'd be interested to find out what that will, will show. Should states or the federal government outlaw militias? And how does the concept of private militias r not relate to militias in the Second Amendment of the U.S. Constitution? <clears throat> the U.S. Constitution Second Amendment says that, in effect, the state shall have the right to have well-regulated militias. And this has been interpreted since the late 1800s by the United States Supreme Court and in numerous cases thereafter that that means the National Guard or a militia that's regulated by a state. And it's, it, it was as if the framers of the Constitution saw how important it was not to have private armies running around, so they put the word well in there, almost like underlining regulated. There is no right to a private army in a democracy. No country on earth allows private armies to exist. They call them guerrilla units and they chase them around in the hills. In, in, in this country, 
the bogus argument is used, as I mentioned earlier, about the militias that founded this country, and we need to have militias today. Now, in America, we have the right to revolution. There's no question about that. And if these people really, truly want to have a revolution, then they have that right. But we have a right as a free people to protect our democratic society. States long ago recognized what I just said. 24 states have laws that outlaw militias. You cannot have a militia in those states. And 17 others have laws that outlaw paramilitary training. But they're not enforced. It's like the Attorney General wrote me of a state I won't mention after we pointed these laws out. He said, look, we don't want to bother these people because they might become worse. Well, I had the, I had the good fortune of working with Mark White, former Attorney General of Texas and then Governor, and we used the militia statute of Texas to put Lewis Beam and his 2500 Klan paramilitary group out of business with a court order enforcing a state militia statute. And in North Carolina, I was appointed special United States Attorney to prosecute in a criminal contempt case the white patriot militia for violating North Carolina's anti-militia law. They were involved in stealing supplies from Fort Bragg, etc. So these laws have been used. The Southern Poverty Law Center, its Militia Task Force, and Klan Watch have been the only people that have used them, both times with the help of lawful authorities, attorney generals and federal prosecutors. They can be used, they should be used. If a bully's on the block and he punches a kid in the nose, you don't win anything by trying to appease the bully, saying he might punch five more kids. If he's doing something wrong, fine. You don't need AK-47s to have free speech. You can disarm yourself and get your group out in public and say all you want to say without having a private army. I would like to present to you uh, a certificate of appreciation and a mug for coming here today. Thank you. <clears throat> and you know, we have a history of asking a funny question, and there was one question asking about your accent, which I thought might be funny. But I, I, I think I won't ask a funny question. And so the last question is, why isn't the Christian right more active in challenging the religious views of these militias and the Christian identity groups? <clears throat> That's a good question, and I think Pat Robinson's in a good position to do something about that. His book, The New World Order, has been viewed by these people to, to, as, a, as a symbol, to, as, as a book, to further their cause. I don't think he intended that. I think he represents a religious view that might not be mine, it may not be yours, but he is in a great position to exert leadership in that respect. And concerning my accent, well, I got it from Peggy Robinson, the chairman <laughs> of your committee here. Peggy and I went to the University of Alabama. And, uh, and we worked together in, in college, and, uh, and I guess it's something that we hold dear and near to our heart. Thank you. I will ask as many as time permits. I'd now like to introduce our head table guests and ask them to stand briefly when their names are called. From your right, Jean Methvin, Reader's Digest. Eleanor Clift, Contributing Editor, at Newsweek. Jeff Hardy, Mobile Press Register. Chris Castile, Washington Bureau Chief, Daily Oklahoman. Carla Calabrese, attorney with Powell, Goldstein, Frazier, and Murphy. Sylvia Smith, Fort Wayne Journal-Gazette. Mrs. Elizabeth Dees. Peggy Robertson, freelance journalist and chairman of the National Press Club Speakers Committee. Joseph J. Levin, Jr., co-founder, Southern Poverty Law Center. Peter Aisler, USA Today. Leland Schwartz, 
editor and publisher, State's News Service. Larry Bivens, Detroit News. Andy Alexander, Deputy Washington Bureau Chief, Cox Newspapers, and Ann Scales of the Boston Globe. <clears throat> Hate crimes, high profile and obscure ones, appear to be on the increase in America. Many of us are stunned. Bond, Bond and Levin had the civil rights community ties. Dees brought them a law degree from the University of Alabama and a knack for raising money. That gets us to the rest of the Morris Dees story. While most people know him for his civil rights litigation work, he is also an astute entrepreneur. Before he finished college, he had started a direct mail sales company that specialized in publishing books. A decade after he started it, he became a millionaire by selling the business to the Times Mirror Company. That gave him time for politics and law. In 1972, Deese became the finance director for Democratic presidential candidate George McGovern. Using his tried and true direct mail techniques, Deese raised more than $24 million for McGovern from 600,000 small donors. He did the same job for Jimmy Carter's successful 1976 bid for the White House. Then he jumped ship and in 1980 worked for Senator Ted Kennedy in Kennedy's bid to unseat Carter. People know Morris Dees, who know Morris Dees describe him as intelligent, creative, dedicated, mercurial, unpredictable. Whatever people think of him, they always admit he is bold and persistent. And he has told me that when he was a young man, he was a star farmer, which is something near and dear Good afternoon, and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Sonia Hilgren. I am president of the National Press Club and editor of Farm Journal. I'd like to welcome club members and your guests in the audience today, as, though, as well as those of you watching on C-SPAN, listening on public radio, or on the global internet computer network. Before introducing our head table, I would like to remind you of some speakers we have in coming days and weeks. On Tuesday, April 23rd, Charles Lewis, Executive Director of the Center for Public Integrity, will talk about the financing of presidential campaigns. On Thursday, April 25th, Henry Cisneros, the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, will present the first annual state of America's communities. And on Wednesday, May 8th, Christopher Patton, governor of Hong Kong, will address a press club audience. Transcripts and audio and videotapes of press club luncheons are available by calling 1-800-NPC-2334. If you have questions for our speaker, please write them on the cards at your tables and pass them, but not today's speaker. He is Morris Dees a Montgomery, Alabama direct mail pioneer turned hate crimes attorney. Over the years, through his Southern Poverty Law Center and its Klan Watch arm, Dees has emerged as one of the top watchdogs of hate crimes in America. He's had some major successes, taking the bite out of hate crimes by hitting them where it hurts in their pocketbook. In 1987, he secured a $7 million jury award in federal court on behalf of the mother of the late Michael Donald lynched in Mobile, Alabama by members of the Ku Klux Klan. The verdict marked the first time a Klan group had been held liable for the violent acts of its members. In 1990, Dee secured a $12.5 million jury award in Portland, Oregon against white supremacist Tom Metzger and the white Aryan nation for their role in the beating death of skinheads by, by I'm sorry, the beating death by skinheads of a young black student. These and other cases are bankrolled by the Southern Poverty Law Center, founded in 1971 by Dees, Julian Bond, and Joseph J. Levin, Jr. They wanted to expand civil rights litigation beyond that being pursued mostly by the NAACP Legal Defense and Education, to my heart. But on a much more serious vein, this week marks the first anniversary of the bombing in Oklahoma City.
Deese, who has tracked far-right paramilitary groups since the early 1980s, tells us in his own way that bold and persistent steps are needed today to combat hate in America. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the National Press Club, Morris Deese, the Chief Trial Counsel for the Southern Poverty Law Center and its Militia Task Force. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you very much. I appreciate the invitation from this prestigious National Press Club to be here to speak today. I want to thank those who have contributed to the Southern Poverty Law Center who came as our guest today also, because without your support and those other people who contribute, the Law Center would not be able to run the projects that it does including our Teaching Tolerance Education program that today provides tolerance education films, books, and videos free to over 55,000 schools. I am glad to come here as a speaker, but I wish I had been able to 